In America, uh, we have a national holiday tomorrow called Thanksgiving. The actual origins of that holiday are problematic in terms of the relationship of the uh, people who came to uh, North America and uh, their relationships with the native people who are already here, whose land was taken from them, usually violently. And that said, um, you know, while there is a day of Thanksgiving, which, you know, in my own personal history with it is, is a sweet opportunity to come together with friends and family and eat too much and drink too much and eat too much and drink too much <laughs> all the way around. Um, uh, more broadly, this is a wonderful time, uh, as is all the time, to open to the benefits of gratitude. And so I want to talk a bit about gratitude and maybe offer some ways of looking at it that uh, might seem a little fresh for you, uh, perhaps. And as I explore this, I really invite you to keep coming into just the feeling of it. Uh, and you can both deepen your, or you can expand your depth of gratitude and your breadth of gratitude. Uh, breadth being more and more things to feel thankful for and depth being um, in, in involving a greater receptivity, a greater emotional weight, uh, in effect, becoming gratitude as a way of being over time. So <clears throat> to begin here, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. And along the way, feel free to use the chat feature if you want to offer comments and, and say things. Uh, during the break, I read all the chats. So I read all the chats, and I feel very touched and grateful to you. Uh, many of whom have left really sweet acknowledgments with comments about me. So I, I appreciate that. And um, the essence of gratitude has to do with receiving. Uh, if we get something or maybe we do some kind of exchange, you know, we give someone $10 and we buy something for $10 and they give us the thing we bought, you know, maybe we're glad they, they gave us the thing we bought or maybe through our efforts uh, we earn a paycheck or some kind of fee and we get our fee, we're glad about it, but that's not gratitude. Gratitude is about what's freely given to us that is a gift, in effect. They didn't have to do that. So for example, your gifts to me uh, in the acknowledgments uh, in, the, in the sidebar, I feel grateful for those because you gave them to me. Thank you, right? Um, so that's the essence of gratitude. It's about receiving, in effect, a gift. And uh, now it could be broadly the gifts of life, the gifts of gravity, you know, that we're not all floating off the planet, you know, like, ah. um, or it could be the gifts of green growing things that, you know, produce much of the oxygen that we breathe and, and so forth. Um, you know, there are different ways of relating to these gifts, but whatever they are, it's a gift. And as Robert Emmons, who's a researcher at the University of California, Davis, arguably the world's leading authority on gratitude, he did much of the original research on it, on it and he has some wonderful books about it, Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S, Robert Emmons. Uh, he points out that precisely because gratitude is about receiving gifts, upon which, in effect, we're dependent, that Gratitude can open people up to feelings of vulnerability or dependence that are uncomfortable. And because it's uncomfortable, then they push away the gratitude. So this practice of gratitude is uh, very close to central preoccupation, central themes and opportunities in the Buddhist wisdom tradition, notably an appreciation of uh, the ways in which everything occurs interdependently, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it. So we depend upon a vast web of things in the present, and we depend upon uh, that a vast web of things that have been made or constructed or handed forward to us for our very living moment by moment by moment. And that sense of interbeing initially can feel kind of spooky. It's like, whoa, wait a minute here. You mean I'm, I'm, I'm not in charge of my life in every which way? Whoa, wait a minute here. You mean the bottom really could 
fall out? Well, yeah, it could. And it doesn't. We keep on being. We keep on being. So there, in gratitude, there is a movement into profound wisdom, the wisdom of interdependence, um, and the wisdom of giving and receiving. You know, we give to others who receive from us with their gratitude. I've seen many of you express your gratitude, let's say, for me. So we give to others and we receive from others. And that's an absolutely central aspect of life. So there's this interdependent quality to it. Um, I liken it to a standing wave. Uh, our being is, as um, Evan Thompson put it in his wonderful book, Mind in Life, standing streaming. You know, like a river going over a big boulder, there's a standing wave. The shape of the wave and the molecules of water in it at any exact instant are continually changing. And there's a dynamism in it. There's an impermanence in it. And still there's a stability in it. We are this standing streaming. We are this standing streaming. Our living, our being, uh, is based on the receiving of all that we receive whew, as it passes through us, as us. And gratitude can bring you into an intimacy with your own living uh, and a, a sense of immediacy in what you are uh, receiving from others, receiving from nature, receiving from the physical universe, just receiving from, you know, the last person who smiled at you. Uh, it can, you know, gratitude can really bring you in to a very profound, if you will, spiritual sense of receivingness as what we receive continually changes and keeps on flowing. So in gratitude, we have these two fundamental uh, characteristics identified by the Buddha a long time ago as central to existence, characteristics of our existence, uh, interdependence and impermanence. Gratitude also um, helps us deal with that other characteristic of three that the Buddha identified 2,500 years ago, which is the fact sometimes of suffering. Suffering is not the whole of life, uh, although in some people's lives it's, it's very extensive, unfortunately, uh, but certainly suffering is inevitable. Suffering occurs in even the most privileged and advantaged life. What gratitude offers us is a framework in which we can hold that suffering. Gratitude does not cover over the suffering. It is not a spiritual bypass. It is not, gratitude does not overlook all of which, all of what is so difficult. In some ways, actually, gratitude um, helps us really appreciate uh, the difficulties and challenges of life, including for other people, as we are, when we are grateful for our, for our own good fortune. Gratitude helps us hold the suffering. Yes, there is suffering. Much of, if not most of our suffering is not inherent in life. It's poignant and full of possibility that so much of our suffering is actually constructed by us in various ways, in our reactions to things, all right? So, you know, gratitude helps us appreciate that um, there is so much more to life than suffering and that even amidst what's difficult for us, we can find things that we're grateful for. So that's kind of an orientation to this. And I wanted to embed gratitude uh, kind of at a, in a deeper way than, you know, a sweet, but, you know, some maybe potentially sort of superficial uh, Hallmark card kind of approach. And uh, when we appreciate that gratitude, the practice of gratitude can be a very far reaching and deeply rooted practice of wisdom that can lead to um, a feeling liberated, actually, from many reactive patterns and from many misunderstandings about the nature of life. When we appreciate that gratitude can take us in, has these steps, and can take us into these steps. Wow. 
<laughs> as somebody wrote, I think more than one person wrote in the sidebar, we can be grateful for gratitude. So I'd like to offer uh, some kind of more detailed points now uh, in a practical way uh, in the context, hopefully, of this of this kind of uh, wisdom I'm, you know, or this wisdom perspective I'm trying to offer here. And so uh, with regard to gratitude, I also want to make the, the point that a lot of research shows that the capacity for thankfulness and the experiences of thankfulness and building up a mood, gratitude can be a mood, right? We can experience it as a state, but also gratitude can become a trait as a sort of background mood of gratitude as we approach and, and as we receive the next moment, the next breath, the next sunrise, you know, the next event in our lives, that those events land on. What is the ground they land on? They can land on um, a, a increasingly cultivated mood of gratitude. One of the benefits of um, practices of gratitude, sort of states of gratitude, and in particular, a mood of gratitude, a trait of gratitude, is that it makes people more resilient. In addition to fostering happiness, gratitude helps people um, you know, cope better with challenges and um, bounce back more rapidly uh, and actually sleep better, studies have shown. People, as they increase trait gratitude, they tend to sleep better. Uh, as you fall asleep, a really sweet way to do it um, is to just be aware of one or more things that you feel blessed by. And you don't have to relate to that word in a religious context. Uh, there's actually a practice called the three blessings exercise where before falling asleep, you think of three things every night, take it on if you want, um, that you feel grateful for. And it's okay if they're the same three things every night. It could even be one thing three times, but you know, there's a place for uh, you know exploring and you know different kinds of things you feel grateful for. Um, researchers were actually bowled over by the impact of people who would take probably a minute or so just before uh, going to bed, where they would just focus on what they feel blessed about, what they feel thankful for. Maybe writing it down, maybe just thinking about it, maybe telling another person, saying it out loud. People keep gratitude journals. Um, I know people who send each other their daily gratitude, you know, and, you know alongside their, their daily, uh, you know, lament about politics these days or something. You know, they send their daily gratitude, something they're grateful for. So practices like this um, help us feel better. They lift our mood, they buttress stress, which has physiological, physical health benefits too. They help us sleep better and they make us more resilient. So that's pretty good. Okay, so what are some ways to deepen in our practices of gratitude? Uh, just reading through um, you know, the comments in the, in the chat, uh, you can see a tremendous amount of wisdom from many, many people about ways to be grateful and ways to, as I've said, to deepen the depth of your gratitude as well as the, the breadth of it. So uh, here are a few practical suggestions. First, it helps to just start with the low-hanging fruit. Uh, right now, right now, if you like, what's something uh, about which it's easy for you to access the sense of gratitude? Um, I'll just give you a funny example. So of all things, we're getting some pizzas, some takeout pizzas that you bake at home, partly for our kind of sort of Thanksgiving meal tomorrow. And I don't know why it just popped into my mind, like, I feel grateful for pizza. You know, it's one of the great gifts of life. Thank you, Italians, <laughs> or whoever makes the best pizza, you know, like, wow. And <clears throat> Even a simple thing, which goes into, by the way, uh, also some deep Buddhist wisdom teachings. When you think of something like, I'm going to do pizza, uh, when, <laughs> pizza practice, pizza meditation, uh, when, you, when you go into it, um, you can become aware of some of the many elements in that pizza and the many causes and conditions that had to occur to enable that pizza, the half half-made pizza that you're going to bake tomorrow, let's say, to be there. So pizza, 
we have the grains, gluten-free in my family, uh, the grains that are, that are used to, to make the crust. Where did those grains come from? They came from plants, plants that internalize sunlight, essentially, to grow. Plants that were domesticated and cultivated by people who lived 10,000 years ago, thousands and thousands of years ago. You know, the tomatoes in the tomato sauce, the ways that tomatoes were gradually domesticated and, and made. And then, then you have all the people who farm this stuff. And, and then the technologies that enable farming to occur and you know, organic, hopefully, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, stuff comes together and then it's transported. All the people, I'll sit down to a meal sometimes and just take uh, some breaths and just reflect on what... All that had to happen for one little thing on my plate, one little tomato, let's say, on my plate to come into being, to be received by me. I, we can't possibly earn all the gifts that went into a pizza. Yeah, okay, we, you know, we give the restaurant some money for it and we get it back. But in the broadest sense, who can earn, you know, the domestication of agriculture, right? Who can earn the magnificence of a tomato? Who can earn the gifts of the sun? You know, this big ball of gas, you know, whose, whose light and warmth comes to earth and gets internalized in these green growing things, which then we take into ourselves as we, as we chew and swallow and taste sunlight. Wow, that's just a pizza, okay? So start with something that, Maybe for you, it's not pizza. That might be a little strange, but you know, your pet, your friend, uh, your sweetheart, uh, you know, a teacher, a parent, uh, someone who really stepped out of their way for you. Just something easy. Uh, you know, someone famous, maybe you're just grateful for. Thank you, the Dalai Lama, for being so brave and, and wise for so many years, perhaps. So, so you prime your pump, okay? as a practice of gratitude. Start with something easy, you know, low hanging fruit, let's say, and then explore it. Wow, what, what have you received in this sometimes simple thing? Maybe someone is just warm toward you. They don't have to be warm toward you. Maybe in the larger frame of the relationship, there's a certain giving and getting that's in the larger frame, okay. But at any particular moment, their warmth, let's say, is a kind of gift in the moment. You can't make them do it. You didn't pay them to give you warmth, hopefully. Um, so even in that simple thing, what's in that? What are the depths in their friendliness for you? You know, the broad depths of the history of your relationship the depths in our evolution as social primates who really are, can be friendly and sweet and good to each other. The processes in that person that led them to be warm with you in that moment, to smile at you. Wow, it can just break your heart wide open in thankfulness for all the strands, all the threads that are woven together in this simple offering that would be so easy to underestimate or take for granted their smile, let's say, their warmth, or over here, the pizza, <laughs> maybe <laughs> presented <laughs> by someone who's smiling. Um, it would be so easy to just go, oh yeah, pizza, oh yeah, smile, thanks, whatever. Uh, but to actually, wow, go into it. You know, the deeper we go into it, the wider and vaster it becomes. So starting with something simple, maybe as a practice as a gratitude, and then opening out, I think it's also helpful to deliberately look for things to be grateful for. Uh, I've done practices and where you're just walking along a sidewalk and then your gaze is drawn to the sidewalk and you see the sparkling of the grains of sand in it. And then you get drawn even more closely into where did those grains of sand come from? And 
you become aware of the fact, as you probably know, that every atom, pretty much every element in the universe that's heavier than helium was made inside a star, usually when it was blowing up. So all those grains of sand are stardust. You know, we're walking along and maybe we're seeing reflected in them the light of our own sun. And so pick a simple thing or look for simple things. And then we get drawn more and more into that. And then drawn into the people who figured out how to make sidewalks and pulled the sand together and, you know, cement and all the rest of that. So we can deliberately look around. For example, the gifts of the physical world. Um, you know, I'm just kind of endlessly like a child. <laughs> you know, just bowled over by the weirdest stuff like paper. Whoa. Trees. People figured out paper. Thank you, paper. Somebody cut that. It's so nice, isn't it? It's so right angled. Oh, makes my OCD heart happy. Uh, so, you know, to look around in the physical world, all kinds of things, you know, paint, trees, flowers, air, strange creatures, little, little bugs flying around, you know, like, wow, thank you, right? So the gifts of the physical world, the gifts of nature, uh, the gifts of life. It's just wild to, I think somebody pointed out once that roughly 20% of our DNA we share with bananas. Okay, so you're holding a banana. <laughs> like, Hello, cousin. <laughs> you know, banana, right? And then you just think of all the things that have had to happen over hundreds of millions of years. I mean, just our own nervous system has been evolving for about 600 million years so that we're here. I mean, I don't know about you, I'd rather be a human than a banana, even on the worst day of my life, right? Um, and think of just DNA, life, evolution. I mean, it is bizarre to realize, this can be a little intense here, if you think about how evolution proceeds, it's through eliminating uh, 99 plus percent of all the members of a species uh, you know, so that uh, very small mutations can be selectively advantaged to persist and then be passed along to form and develop a new species. So in a very real sense, we're here today, you know, three and a half billion years after life began on our planet, 600 million years of an evolving nervous system, we're here today through advantages that have accumulated through the deaths of countless, countless, countless sentient, countless living beings. Uh, their deaths, many of which were not because they were not fit, quote unquote, for survival, but just random accidents, you know, high death rates. Uh, we were watching a, a documentary recently, some, my, my octopus friend, you, you may have seen it, it's incredibly sweet. and. Uh, the marine biologist uh, diver who became friends with this octopus for a year just mentioned in passing that a typical octopus will lay something like 100,000 eggs. And the one octopus that we were watching in the documentary is the one that lived. It's the one that lived out of 100,000 or so who didn't make it, right? Like it's really something to appreciate that. And, and here we are today. Wow, we can never pay it back. That's another reason why people sometimes have difficulty with gratitude, because you can't pay it back. You just can't pay it back. You can pay it forward, as people put it. You can honor the gifts you've received. I think of um, being human in some ways and being you know, born in the 20, 20th century and being privileged in a variety of ways to the social class, ethnicity, gender, and so forth, born in America, uh, 1952. Um, uh, and, um, you know, we can, all, it, it's kind of like, and who knows what previous lives, who knows about that. But anyway, it's as if we've been handed a baton by people who ran really hard, ran fast and hard get us in this position, they hand us the baton. Okay, now it's our turn. And we, we don't wanna suck, right? <laughs> we wanna hand it off well. We wanna appreciate what we've been given and honor it as best we can, not out of some crippling sense of burden and duty, but just a sense of gratitude and appreciation and a certain delight. 
and in a life that enables these opportunities, which then we can hand forward uh, to the next people coming along. So, you know, that's one way also to feel grateful, to, to offer that kind of reflection. Then, of course, just think about all the people who have come through for you, right, in, in all kinds of ways, including strangers, little, little things, people who opened a door for you, people who gave you a useful piece of information. I think back on a, a kind of, I think in retrospect, a, a shy and lonely teacher of mine um, in high school who had an open lunchroom. And so people, usually social misfits like me, <laughs> would wander in and just hang out. And I felt seen and appreciated uh, and just at a kind of being to being level. And, and I had interesting conversations with him and he made a difference for me. He probably does it, you know, I suspect he's no longer alive, but wow, he did a, he made a difference. So, you know, all those are beautiful things to be grateful for. Um, I'll mention uh, another thing or two and then see which, if you have any questions or comments about this overall. Um, <clears throat> when we have a chance to feel grateful, you know, as I've said many times, uh, it's so important to take in the good. In other words, to feel it, to stay with it. And it's striking, isn't it, how often that other people have made an offering to us. They've given us a little compliment. They've acknowledged us. They've praised us maybe. Um, they've been generous in some way. And then we scoot right on. Whoosh. Maybe out of habit, maybe out of a little awkwardness, a little uncomfortableness, we scoot right on. And it's really different. Um, I've adopted from time to time, um, more time than not when I'm deliberate about it, a practice of deliberately slowing it down and um, registering that the other person has really given me something there. It could be something really pretty small. Uh, and even if what they've given me, eh, I'm not sure I want it. Like some advice, you know, my wife might tell me how to be better in some way. Um, maybe I don't want that exactly. But on the other hand, when I look at her and I look beneath the words and behind the eyes, Almost always, I can find good intentions there. Good intentions to help things be better. Good intentions to support herself. Good intentions for me specifically and directly. So we can really appreciate that in what other people give us. And to do that, though, we have to slow it down. We have to kind of slow it down for a second or two or three, a breath, let's say, to go, oh. Oh, and then what starts to happen, and you can think about this when the roles are reversed for you, what starts to happen as you register the gift, they, in Dan Siegel's wonderful phrase, feel felt. And in fact, through your receptivity to their giving, you in turn are giving to them the opportunity to feel received, to feel felt. And then, you know, it can just reverberate as you just kind of feel it with each other where essentially, you know, when you really receive their gift, they have a chance to feel felt. You then feel that they felt you, as it were, or you feel that they felt felt. That makes you feel really good. And then there you are, both a glow. Uh, you know, three, five, ten seconds in. Uh, not too bad. I'm not saying you have to do this all the time, but I just think it's really interesting. We have within our power on a time scale of seconds. Most of our power is on a time scale of seconds. That's where we have power to take an extra second or two or three or to disengage from something a second or two sooner. Uh, my friend has an acronym, WAIT, W-A-I-T. It stands for, why am I talking? <laughs> I've told him sometimes we, we should have the acronym WASTE, as in W-A-I-S-T, you know, like a person's waist, you know, the belt goes around their waist. Why am I still talking? Anyway, so sometimes we help ourselves by, you know, on the time scale of seconds, 
disengaging sooner or extending something for a few more seconds. And those few seconds really make a difference. They're within our power. They make a real difference. And then with repeated episodes, multiple times a day, you know, two times a day, four times a day, just dropping into rapport, kind of sinking in uh, with someone who's given you something, even something really simple, uh, just thanking them, um, can really make a big difference for you again and again and again, and make a big difference for them as well. All right. So um, how about we see if uh, there's some questions or comments uh, coming in on the chat. I can see just a wealth of information. Um, and maybe I'm seeing things that people are, you know, helping me kind of clarify some things. I don't know exactly what the shared DNA is with a banana, 50, 50%, 20%, I don't know. Uh, Wikipedia probably knows, but you know, it's not, it's not all of it. So anyway, that, and then uh, the, uh, the documentary was um, My Octopus Teacher. It, very touching and also very beautiful. Okay, so any questions or comments? Uh, about gratitude uh, that you'd like me to speak to. And also, if there's one person in particular who um, has a, you know, a, a question or a comment they want to say that's really related to what I'm doing here tonight, uh, you know, when I get to this, I'll invite you if I feel I have time for that, and you can raise your hand and I'll find you. Okay. So I'm seeing some questions coming in from Kay that uh, is gratitude connected with meaning? giving meaning to everything. I think that's very interesting. And meaning, now people, you know, I also had a, a, a mentor uh, in college who said, what do you mean mean, right? But also literally, what do you mean meaning? So meaning though, typically is a kind of abstraction. It's a conceptualization, often supported by language that we add to the thing as it is. And uh, there's a place for that. You know, there you are thirsty and someone offers water, there's the water itself as it is, and then there's maybe the meaning that perhaps they're sharing their water with you. So they get less as you have more, and that adds a certain meaning to it. Um, I think that uh, we can be grateful for things without uh, being abstract about it, uh, there's there's almost a bodily process that's quite emotional and simple and nonverbal potentially that's like foundational, you know. Call that foundational gratitude. That doesn't necessarily have to get caught up in meaning making. But then, sure, we can add meaning to it, um, and we can add perspective to it that can deepen the sense of gratitude. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention uh, that's really interesting and striking is to realize that when other people are being generous to us, the value of generosity for them is thwarted if we do not receive their gift or much of the value. Yes, there's the value of their good intention, but the full circle is not completed. So it's kind of interesting to think of receiving the gifts of others as a form of service. Kind of cool right? Um, you know, thankfulness as a way of contributing to others, uh, in part because it enables this wonderful circle of giving. Uh, you may be aware that in the Buddhist tradition, uh, one of the foundational principles is generosity, not out pathological altruism, not forced giving that makes you feel like you're running on empty, but the simple natural generosity of making an offering into the bowl of a nun. Uh, or a monk, as you know, because that's what they eat. They eat what gets put in their bowl. They don't go out shopping at Safeway. They eat what gets put in their bowl. Well, this is the culture of generosity is really foundational. It's really sweet. For the benefits of generosity to occur, including the release of the contraction of self, the ways in which generosity, healthy generosity, can open us into a feeling of abundance, the ways that we feel uh, much flows through us some of which we pass along, um, those benefits, you know, are they get obstructed uh, if we don't open to receiving ourselves. Okay, so let's see here. Um, 
Ah, well, Teresa, uh, you know, speaking to uh, 7.16 p.m. You can see that on, you can lo locate that in the chat. Uh, Teresa is speaking to the ways in which I um, pointed out that we can feel vulnerable and anxious about being gratitude. And she said, yeah, there's something about uh, her own feelings of uneasiness about this. And, um, you know, I think there are different things that we can associate to gratitude, sometimes depending on our own childhood. For example, uh, my parents grew up in the Depression, and, um, you know, a lot of people were hungry. I mean, people are hungry in the wealthiest countries of the world today. You know, food insecurity is a fancy way for saying they don't have enough to eat, uh, as well as, you know, around the world. So my own parents uh, grew up at a time where they, they both faced a lot of poverty uh, in their own upbringings in different kinds of ways. And so when they would put food on the table uh, for, you know, my, my siblings and I, uh, for my siblings and me uh, in the 50s, they would say, not, um, um, uh, you know, not rarely, <laughs> they would say, eat was put in front of you, people are starving around the world. So there's sometimes this sense that you better receive and you, you know, you better, uh, there's kind of a weirdness around it. Be thankful or else. Right, and sometimes that can get dropped into a religious framework that can come with a certain oppressive topspin. And so then, I'm not saying this is the case, by the way, for Teresa, but I just I'm going to name something for people that in your own um, history, it might be interesting to to look at uh, some of your own uh, associations to gratitude, or another one. Um, is that we can have relationships with people whose giving to us is like a Trojan horse. You know, they give, but their strings attached. Their giving is a way to influence us or to get us to open our defenses as we receive their, their love even. And then once we've opened the gates, whoop, they're inside and they kind of occupy the territory. So, or maybe, uh, frankly, uh, even beyond kind of fairly commonplace forms of tainted giving or strings attached giving, there can be very abusive, um, um, very abusive forms of, of giving that um, just basically are used seductively uh, and in ways that are really problematic. So understandably, people can grow up or become really wary of lowering their guard to open into to, to gratitude, and um, that that and those 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 issues are can be rooted in a person's psychology. So you might want to be aware of that if there's something going on about that. Um, one of uh, um, the things that can also come up for people is a loss of control when you start really recognizing how. Uh, if, uh, you know, we are dependent on so many things. I mean, one thing that, that COVID, you know, the current plague has brought home to us is our deep dependencies, layers of dependencies on manufacturing toilet paper or delivering this stuff or having enough of it in the store or whatever, or dependencies on public health systems or leaders, as we were talking before we began, who are competent at a most basic level, at the public health level, at the highest level of leadership of the response to a plague. And so you suddenly realize, whoa, you know, we were counting on all kinds of things that hmm, weren't actually so reliable. It can be really scary to kind of face our own dependencies, but there's no way around it. There's no way around it. And sometimes when we take things for granted that we're depending on, then we overlook gradual breakdowns in those in those systems. And um, if we don't have the uh, strength and humility to face our own dependencies, we can uh, let things kind of fall apart and get away with it day after day, year after year, until a storm comes, until a plague comes, until our civic society, uh, civil society is really pressure tested. Uh, in unprecedented ways. And then suddenly we realize, whoa, these institutions, these systems, these relationships, these supplies, 
um, you know, these resources inside oneself have not been really invested in sufficiently. So, and so it can be helpful to appreciate our dependency because it can take us to that clarity here. Okay, let me just see if there are other questions or comments that have come in that maybe I can speak to. Anybody have, by the way, in our maybe waning minutes, anybody want to wave their hand, say something, ask something specific to this topic? No, I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, I'll just keep on rolling then. I have about five more minutes. Let me just see here. Yeah. Okay, so um, no problem. Let's see, everything's good. Da, 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 da. Why do people find my gratitude off-putting? This is from Kay at seven twenty-five. Even though I am sincere and enthusiastic, I don't know. <laughs> I think sometimes because they're weird. <laughs> I don't know, um, but I know what you mean. I mean, I really do. And I, well, I'll, one thing I'll just say from my experience as a therapist, <coughs> when we are heartfelt ourselves with good intention in simple, authentic ways, that itself is an implicit uh, or it's an invitation for greater closeness. And so you see, there's always this rhythm in relationships you know, closeness, distance, closeness, distance. And we're kind of titrating sometimes the closeness so we find an optimal distance that we're comfortable with. Not too close, not too far away. All right. If we are really sincere and grateful to other people, uh, that can stir up discomfort in them about being appreciated. Maybe they're kind of nervous about that, or maybe they're afraid that if if they're appreciated, it sets a standard or a bar that they have to keep living up to, and they don't they don't want that. They don't want us to count on it. Maybe so they kind of fend off our gratitude, uh, or maybe they they grew up in environments where uh, you know gratitude was the entry into the Trojan horse. They don't want that, or maybe just the openness and vulnerability and sweetness. And, you know, the positive tone of gratitude, gratitude is a positive emotion, uh, is experienced by another person as a pulling for relatedness. Not that you're doing it manipulatively, but it's how it arrives in them. It's a pulling for relatedness. Our lovingness, your lovingness, your warmth, your kindness, your sweetness, your, 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 your simple, innocent, thankfulness can land in other people as a kind of drawing into greater relatedness. Maybe because it your natural open-heartedness um, stirs up in them longings for greater closeness, which in their history were followed by disappointment, neglect, and pain. So then they distance they maybe push back against your gratitude or brush it off, let's say, or act like, oh, you no need to be grateful for that, almost like they're criticizing you as a strategy to, to, to uh, reestablish for, for them an optimal distance. This is a very common and powerful dynamic that we may not realize is happening in other people who are uncomfortable when they get more than this close let's say. And one way that, to give you a concrete example that appeared for me for quite a while before I realized what was going on, you know, I'm a therapist, I'm supposed to have, you know, and I naturally do have unconditional positive regard for my clients. And I would find it would, that I would get odd reactions sometimes from people when I was just warm, appropriately warm with them. They would intellectualize or distance or blow it off or get sarcastic or be kind of contentious or pick a quarrel with me as a therapist. And I finally realized, no, my well-meaning warmth uh, actually was challenging for them. It kind of stirred up stuff in them that they wanted to, they wanted to back away from, right? And so um, anyway, it, it's kind of useful to be aware of this dynamic when it's present in other people. And paradoxically, to help other people receive your warmth, sometimes it's skillful actually to do little things 
that help them experience a little more room to breathe between you and them. It's sort of like being really warm from about four feet away, you know, apart from COVID, right? Rather than, you know, kind of moving into what for them is an emotional distance that's a little invasive. Okay, did a bit of a digression there, but that particular dynamic um, I have actually found to be quite quite helpful. All right, so we're moving toward an end. Um, I certainly, um, you know, I mean, I said it at the start, I'll say it again. I'm just kind of bowled over that you, you're you here. And I feel really grateful in a broad way as well as a human and a citizen and a parent and someone who cares about humanity and cares about our earth altogether that others are practicing. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your involvement, your investment. Um, Thank you for your practice. And um, that's one of the most fundamental things that we can be grateful for in other people, whether it's teachers or alive or not alive any longer, thank them for their practice. You know, there are people I've learned from who've uh, spent their lives in practice, including sometimes in monastic settings. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. And thank you, you. I'm looking at you, <laughs> you. Thank you truly for your practice. Um, I had a, you know, spiritual teacher at one point who said that um, with practice, this this earthly realm is like a kind of purgatory. You know, he was a little grim, uh, you know, but without practice, it's a hell realm. And anyway, I, that's, I don't want to say that too strongly, but it's, I mean it more humorously than anything else. But thank you, thank you, thank you for your practice. So how about in our last minute? We just sit together uh, kind of quietly, letting whatever's been beneficial from this sink in. Um, I won't be able to take any questions at this point, you know, just kind of, kind of to finish up here. But what I'm going to be doing, and I invite you to be doing for the next minute or so, is just resting, resting in a sense of abiding with other people who practice. Doesn't have to be perfect. It's more like we're, we're abiding with others who are open to being called to practice or who return to practice again and again. Alongside others who practice too. It's nice to feel that others are practicing. Very important way to feel buoyed. <laughs> 